I think it's really important for us to stay educated. There's a lot of information out there and information is changing on an almost daily basis. So staying up with these sorts of things I think is important. So uh, uh, I'm working right now to really track this in great detail. And of course, everybody's you know seen these sorts of things, you know, that the number of cases, and this is really just updated as of April 24th. So just a few short weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, our cases were still uh, in the uh, uh, eight to 900,000 range. Uh, of course, everybody knows now we're uh, well over a million uh, cases. And we see this steadily increase. So the the numbers of cases per day are not increasing. That's what we mean by reaching a plateau, but the total number of people that have been affected by COVID-19 are additive on a daily basis. And, you know, I, I really wanted to point out something, you know, that's really important, you know, for us as we age. We hear a lot on the news that, you know, the aging population is getting and just hammered with this and, and it's, it's deadly. And, uh, uh, and some of that is true, but some of that also needs to be understood. So uh, uh, on the bottom left here is a graph that shows total COVID cases in the United States. And so, you know, when we look at this, you know, this is a, as of uh, April 24th, but the same holds true today, the same general trends, the majority of people infected by COVID are not over the age of 65. The majority of people affected by COVID are in the 18 to 65 range, the adult employed, uh, 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 midlife uh, uh, engaged folks. And so overall, uh, there are fewer cases uh, uh, in the aging population. But part of that is that the aging population is a smaller percentage of the population. So on the lower right, when we look at this by percentages, uh, we indeed do see that Yes, there's a higher percentage likelihood of you coming down with COVID if you're over the age of 75. Now, some of this, you know, is confusing because it looks like it might even be lower for those between the age of 65 and 74. Uh, we, we may see how those numbers change over time. We also know that we've heard a lot about the nursing home the catastrophes that we've had in the United States with this, you know, uh, uh, a potential, uh, if you get COVID and you're over the age of 65, you're definitely going to run into trouble. And I think we need to put that into perspective. So we certainly can look at these data again from April 24th, and we can see that when we look at COVID deaths by age group, we do indeed see this steady uh, increase over time, uh, uh, especially taking off after age 65. But when we look at that as a percentage of the population, what we really see are two things that I think are remarkably important to, to recognize is that, yes, the older you are, and that may be related to the more chronic health conditions that a person might have at age 85 versus 65, uh, but we see this dramatic uh, uh, increase. On the other hand, I want you to look at that y-axis, so that's kind of over here, and, and recognize that this is percentile size. Uh, so uh, even for those over the age of 85, 90% of people that get sick with COVID are going to live. Isn't that good news? And watching TV, one might not get that lesson. And uh, uh, if you're in the 65 to 74 year range and you come down with COVID, you've got a 98% chance of not dying from the COVID infection. May not be pleasant, you may, you may not like it, but uh, uh, and certainly we don't want to lower our guard in terms of protecting ourselves because these numbers are low. But if any of you out there are living in absolute fear of, oh my goodness, 
you know, everybody over the age of 70 that comes down with COVID dies. That is not what our data shows us. It is a, a, a relatively small fraction. Uh, uh, we can look also at COVID deaths by residents. And this is very, very interesting here. Uh, uh, when we look just at deaths in general, we see two bars on the lower left come out. One is that nursing home long-term care facility, but the other is this bar for uh, in a person's own home. So they're staying socially isolated and they still come down with COVID and pass away. And, and you know, has to scratch their head and say, you know, well, why would that be? Well, because most of us, you know, probably will pass away in our own homes. When we actually turn that into a percentage on the lower right, we see that the home is not a dangerous place to be. Nursing homes, long-term care facilities need to do a better job in trying to help train those individuals. Uh, and then uh, a place of death unknown begins to rise on that scale uh, as well. We also know that COVID proportionally affects minorities. And so uh, we can see that even though uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, so for instance, in this slide, what they're showing is that 18% of the population is non-Hispanic black. And yet that same segment makes up 32% uh, uh, of the, uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations in those areas. So almost a twofold increase. Uh, why is this? Uh, we're not sure. There are many social determinants of health. We don't think that it's genetics or anything else. We think that it may be access to uh, healthcare resources. It may be uh, 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 have to do with financial stability and the ability to sequester and social distance. Uh, uh, work needs to be done on this, but none, nonetheless, you know, uh, when we're weighing our own individual risk, we really do think about these things. How old are we? What are our comorbid medical uh, uh, issues? What is my place of residence? How likely am I to be exposed there? Uh, what is my racial and ethnic heritage? Very, very important questions. I think we also have to think about, you know, and really educate ourselves and understand COVID signs and symptoms. And there's a few aspects of this that are really important. Everybody thinks about this as a respiratory issue. And it's true that in uh, many cases, uh, uh, that many cases uh, will present as a flu-like illness with fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, but uh, sometimes, sometimes this can present as muscle pain, headache, new loss of taste or smell. So that doesn't mean, you know, if you've been losing your sense of taste and smell over the last 10 years, doesn't mean that you are, uh, have developed a COVID uh, uh, issue. Uh, it uh, uh, means that that's in many part of the normal aging process. But if all of a sudden you go to bed today and wake up tomorrow morning and you can't smell anything, well, you should get yourself in and get tested. Uh, it is true that, uh, uh, you know, multiple chronic conditions, medical conditions, so heart or lung disease, diabetes, do place you at higher risk for COVID com complications. And we know that if we ask the question, are the signs and symptoms of COVID infection different in the elderly or the elderly with or without dementia? The answer is yes. Uh, uh, we know in the aging population, fever is much less common. So many places are using, and we are at our center as well, using temperature checks on uh, everyone that comes in. Those temperature checks can be highly accurate for uh, 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 folks in their 20s or 30s that come down with a COVID infection, but can become less and less useful uh, as one gets older. Uh, we've seen a lot of cases now and are beginning to develop some real experience with the fact that in the aging population, those over the age of 65, sometimes infection presents as confusion. 
we've heard, uh, seen a lot of cases and as dizziness. I'm dizzy and I'm off balance. And we've seen a lot of people present with GI symptoms. As a matter of fact, I was called uh, the other day by uh, uh, by one of my uh, uh, patients who, uh, or patients caregivers who said, you know, he's developed this really serious uh, 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 diarrhea and abdominal pain, and we're wondering if it's related to the medicines. And I, I said, you know, I said, well, we haven't changed any medicines in the last six months. When did the problem start? And they said, well, they woke up with it two days ago. And I said, if it's a new onset, acute illness like that, I know it has nothing to do with his breathing, but get him in now so we can take a look at this and provide supportive care. Uh, we also uh, uh, can look at uh, what we say are objective measures of respiratory status. So uh, what does that mean? That means either for ourselves or for others. How frequently are they coughing? And you know, many people, you know, maybe they worked in the coal mines or, or were a smoker when they were younger, may have a chronic cough. Well, if they're always coughing, we should not, you know, become concerned about that. It's if the frequency of the coughing, they're coughing more and harder than they typically do. We need to think about that. Frequent sneezing, and I know it makes it difficult in Kentucky. We're right in the middle of allergy season. Uh, what a horrible time uh, for uh, 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 COVID to be out in the community. Uh, also, simple things like breathing rate. You know, somebody who's just sitting there should not be breathing like they just jogged around the block. And uh, uh, nowadays, even what we call pulse oximetry. So some of you might have a pulse ox at home for measuring respiratory function. And many of you may not know, many cell phones nowadays have a pulse oximetry, a little uh, uh, typically button on the back where you put your finger on it and it measures your heart rate. And, and many of them will give you your, how much oxygen do you have? Uh, uh, and uh, that's really interesting. Uh, my wife has asthma and uh, it was really acting up about two weeks ago. She called the doctor and she said, should I be concerned or tested for COVID? My breathing is becoming more problematic. At first, I thought it was just my asthma, but maybe it's something more. And they decided on the phone, they decided, nah, we're not gonna, you know, you, this is just your asthma. We don't need to test you. And uh, uh, they called back the next day to check on her and they asked her and she said, well, I'm still having trouble breathing. And she said, no, but uh, my uh, 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 pulse ox is running at 90%. And uh, they said, 90%, you're not higher than that. You're down at 90%. She said, yeah, I'm at 90%. They said, come in immediately and get tested. Now, fortunately, she was negative, but it uh, just goes to show that that can be useful in directing us. Uh, remember that our loved ones with dementia may have a hard time expressing any of these symptoms, not just respiratory symptoms, I'm feeling short of breath, but some of the other symptoms as well. Are they more confused than normal or not? So. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few of the objective guidelines. I am on the emergency COVID response team here at UK in addition to everything else that I do. I've not been deployed yet or put into action, uh, but uh, available as needed. So I've been trained deeply in this area. What we're looking for uh, uh, frequently is a, a fever greater than 100.4. So. A fever is greater than 100.4 may mean that we need to be seen. Respiratory breathing rates greater than 24 breaths per minute. And, you know, how do we do that? Well, you know, we sit with a loved one or we, you know, look at our own breathing and we measure it over 15 seconds. And uh, if you have taken a breath six times in 15 seconds, well, you're at 24 respirations per minute. Pulse oximetry less than 92%. So now you know why they called my wife in for testing because her pulse ox was reading 90%. Not harmful at that level, but it was enough 
for them to say uh, there's some concern here. We also can see some effects on blood pressure and heart rate. So if your blood pressure is less than 90 millimeters of mercury, then uh, uh, that's the top number, then that may be a sign that there's an infection potentially even spreading into your bloodstream and heart rates faster than 100 beats per minute. So again, if you don't, you know, have one of those cell phones that uh, monitors your pulse ox or the like, frequently your blood pressure cuffs at home will measure not only your blood pressure, but your heart rate. Uh, if not, uh, then simply feel your pulse uh, 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 over on the wrist by the thumb and you can feel the beats count them over 15 seconds, multiply that by four, and that will give you your heart rate. Uh, so very, very important. Now I will say for some of you, you gotta use your best judgment. So if, <coughs> excuse me, if you've been checking your pulse oximetry and you're always less than 92%, you're always riding at 88% then that's fine your doctor's aware of that then being at 88% doesn't mean all of a sudden you have COVID it would be if it's a change for you if your systolic blood pressure your top number is always at 90 or below then no that shouldn't be worrisome to you but if it used to be 140 and all of a sudden it's 90 you want to think about that same thing with heart rate uh, as well. We'll use some common sense here. Other uh, uh, thoughts uh, in the aging population, something that I think about uh, as well, uh, and this is just a graphic that looks at primary causes, things that injure the brain. So that could be diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, it could be uh, excessive use of alcohol or head trauma, God forbid a brain tumor. But some of those that we see associated with COVID infection are the infection itself the fever, the uh, delirious nature that, uh, that one can have with the flu and with COVID. Uh, one can have difficulty with their memory and thinking because their oxygen levels are too low. Uh, and uh, to see signs uh, or evidence that COVID infection, the inflammation in the body may predispose to heart attacks and or stroke itself. So uh, when we think about that, you know, when we think that COVID might cause blood clots, we need to think about stroke. You know, what do we think about? Well, we think about the fast algorithm. Is the face drooping? Are the arms weak? Has the speech been involved? And uh, if so, we've got to get right in uh, for timing. And, and the same rules apply for a stroke, whether it's a stroke just caused by lifelong blood pressure or, or a pure act of God or COVID, it's all treated in the same way. Time, time, time. We need to get you into the hospital within three hours to give you some clot busting medicine and try to keep you from permanent disability. Heart attacks with chest pain and pressure, pulmonary embolism as well, a blood clot from the legs that flies up to the lungs. You know, this can be deadly. Uh, it can uh, cause the same sort of chest pain, shortness of breath uh, uh, kind of thing. If it comes on like that, remember, think blood clot, uh, not COVID. If it creeps up on you over a few days, it's more likely COVID without a blood clot. And of course, DDTs, deep venous thrombosis, blood clots in your legs. Look for swelling, especially one leg swelling and the other one's not redness or pain, those are the signs of a blood clot in the legs. And the problem with that is not just that it's an issue for your leg, but that those are the types of blood clots that can fly up and give you a pulmonary embolism. And in some instances, even a heart attack or a stroke. So again, I'm not gonna talk about uh, uh, stroke uh, uh, here today. I wanted to really go on and talk about some of the topics that we wanted to discuss today, which is PPE. You know, by golly, I look back to two, three months ago, and if you had asked somebody a question, you know, as a matter of fact, the first time I heard it on uh, 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 the news, I was like, PPE, what, what in the world are they talking about? 
uh, but PPE is personal protect equipment. And that's going to be different depending on what setting you're in. So we know, you know, in the COVID unit at UK, PPE means dressing up like an astronaut and uh, uh, and uh, uh, entering the rooms uh, uh, with your patients. Uh, why? Because we know they're truly infective uh, in that area. In the rest of the hospital, we're not running around looking like astronauts, uh, I can guarantee you. But we are employing some safe, simple strategies, and that is frequent hand washing believe it or not but ppe really starts with your personal hygiene so frequent hand washing uh, absolutely critical and then uh, making sure that we are uh, protecting parts of us where we could get the virus and in general what we think about is we think about this facial region. So uh, that includes the forehead, the eyes, the nose, cheeks, mouth, chin area. Uh, this is the most important area to protect. COVID needs to reach your mucous membranes to infect you. So yes, you can get it on your skin, but believe it or not, it's not going to make it through your skin. The problem with it getting on your skin is that then you rub your eyes or you touch your mouth. That's how it gets in. So very, very important. So when we think about it, you know, uh, we uh, do know that uh, Dr. Fauci uh, uh, was one of the first uh, uh, from the uh, National Institutes on Health, uh, uh, the Heart, Blood, Lung Institute, uh, uh, an infectious uh, uh, institute, uh, basically uh, uh, said that he thought it was a good idea. Uh, for everybody to wear masks. And uh, I think that that's important. And we'll take a look at what that means. So uh, it can be cloth masks. You know, of course, the big masks that we hear about on the news, the N95s. N95s only really need to be if you are in direct exposure with someone who actually has COVID. Uh, they do not need to be used in public. And a standard cloth or paper surgical mask here's mine, is really, really important. I, uh, I want you to think about, if you're living with a loved one who has dementia, memory or thinking problems, I want you to think about what, what, what do they think about all this, you know? And this young gentleman that I have up here with a black mask on, I don't know, he kind of looks like a, 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 a burglar to me. Uh, 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 think about that. Think about the masks uh, uh, and how this works. Uh, for those of you that may care for a loved one with dementia, I always say, uh, don't ask your loved one to wear their mask unless you're wearing yours too. Uh, but if you put yours on, you may find that they wanna put theirs on too. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of fancy masks that you can get nowadays. Here's this young girl. She's got a, 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 the face of a lion, I think, a Lion King mask. Uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of mask it is. That mask is going to prevent a direct exposure of particles. And, and everybody says, well, it's not as good as an N95 because air can still leak in around it. Well, you know, that's asking those viral particles to bank a 90 degree turn when they hit your cheek don't land on the skin but bank a 90 degree turn navigate your way narrowly through the mask all the way to the oropharynx and then bank another 90 degree turn to get into the mouth and into the airway yes it happens it happens because of the force of inspiration but you know when you actually think about that it actually is quite rare and so we're going to talk about this a little bit but these standard masks these cloth masks that we use paper surgical masks that we use well it's not an n95 but they actually confer 80 percent protection meaning that if i knew and i had somebody who i knew a hundred percent was with active covid infection and i got closer to them than six feet, 
right? I didn't maintain social distancing. What is the likelihood that that mask would protect me? And the answer is 80%. I have an 80% chance that I could interact with that person close up who's actively got the virus and, and able to contaminate me. I would have an 80% protection. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I will say a few simple rules for your masks. Uh, uh, if you're going to get a little animal mask, then purchase it that, that way. Uh, especially these paper masks that I, I, like I have. Don't write on it. Don't paint on it. Don't put solvent glue on it. Uh, that will degrade the material of the mask. And uh, 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 don't cut, tear. Uh, or uh, uh, do things of that nature. Uh, when you're alone, you know, and I'm quite delighted right now, even though I'm in the uh, uh, center, uh, I'm in a room isolated by myself and I can take my mask off. Boy, doesn't that feel good. Uh, uh, so very, very important. If you're uh, 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 a couple, so those of us, you know, that live with our family members, we know that we can't really socially distance from one another. And we have to assume that families as well as couples sometimes are uh, uh, exposed partners. So uh, one really needs to think about this uh, 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 in general. Uh, if you are sharing the same exposures, you don't need to protect yourself. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there, there are sometimes certain precautions that need to be taken. And so I was in the hospital several weeks ago on hospital service, not because I was sick myself, and I uh, uh, potentially could have had exposure. I don't think I had exposure to active COVID cases, but could have. And so uh, we went through precautions when I got home from the hospital every day uh, that I would leave my clothes out in the garage and immediately enter the home and shower with soap and water to shed any viral particles. Uh, and uh, uh, that was great and it was obviously enough because my my wife didn't come down with covid and i was just tested the other day and uh, uh got my yesterday and got my results back today and i am negative for covid as well so taking those precautions is important now do you need to wear a gown uh, not unless you're worried about your clothes becoming contaminated and i think that that's very very important in the hospital sometimes we're dealing with people who have a lot of secretions or bodily fluids and then using a gown is important but in the in the outside world i don't think that it is uh, uh, i've seen anybody uh, uh, out at kroger or pumping gas with a gown on uh, i don't think it would be very helpful for us out there uh, uh, in general I do think it's a good idea to get in the habit, though, if you're used to potentially uh, wearing uh, the same set of clothes for uh, uh, more than a day, I think you may want to think about that. You know, if you're out at Kroger and, you know, there were people waiting in the checkout line with you, coughing behind you, maybe when you get home, you do want to change your clothes, take your old ones, throw them in the, in the washer or dryer. You don't have to burn them or, or anything else, expose them to soap and water. And that's enough to destroy the virus. Uh, the, 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 the COVID virus is actually quite fragile. Uh, uh, the fact that soap and water, it, it just destroys the virus is tremendous. And then a new set of clothes. So, uh, mild management. If any of you do get sick, uh, I, I want you to think about this. I, I, I think, you know, you don't want to be running right into the emergency room. And the, and the reason for that is that you probably have a higher risk of getting infected, if you're going to get infected anywhere, of getting infected in the emergency room where there's all those sick people uh, than uh, anywhere else. Uh, 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 frequently, if you do become sick, it's probably seasonal allergies, your asthma acting up, or a standard bug that somebody can get. 
usually what we say is as long as you're not in respiratory distress or your heart's pounding greater than 100 or your blood pressure is dropping or your, your breathing rate is over 24, uh, that we manage this the same as we would manage any cough or cold, right? So the common cold is caused by coronavirus. A different kind of coronavirus, one that's not deadly, just really annoying and makes us feel miserable. So the same types of strategies can be used. Antihistamines, uh, Claritin, uh, uh, Loratadine, uh, 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 Zyrtex, uh, uh, Cetirazine, uh, and even Benadryl. Remember though, uh, if you're over the age of 65, Benadryl can cause confusion in and of itself. It could make you look like you're delirious. And so be careful with this. Try to use the non-sedating allergy medicines. Remember that Tylenol, Ibuprofen, other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and uh, Aleve, Naproxen, those are good for your standard aches and pains, but remember they can also suppress a fever. So if you're on these every day for your arthritis and you have all the other symptoms of, uh, uh, of COVID except for a fever, remember those could be masking the fever for you. On the other will make you feel better better if you have a lot of those aches and pains so using those is over the counter uh, as well and cough suppressants uh, uh, can be helpful things like mucinex and the like those are symptomatic treatments there are no tr proven treatments where you know uh, as we know from the news you know we're looking few uh, medicines that may pretend be potentially beneficial. Uh, I think that data that we're seeing with some of the antivirals is promising, but I, I want you to understand as well where that data comes from. Uh, they took people in the hospital in intensive care units and found that there was a uh, 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 they spent less time in the intensive care unit if treated with those antivirals. We have no uh, knowledge that for milder symptoms, those antivirals are going to help in the least. If you're at, at home and uh, use oxygen regularly uh, and you need to, feel free to turn it up a little bit. Uh, we do try to use, if you have breathing problems, we do try to use the inhalers, the meter-dosed inhalers, rather than nebulizers. Why? Because if you are coming down with the virus and you put one of those steaming nebulizer masks on your head, it's going to aerosolize the virus and spread it throughout your home uh, and to others. And remember, if your phone has a pulse ox on on it, it's a great way to monitor yourself. So important. Now, if you do have a loved one with dementia, I want you to think about that. You know, uh, we're getting a lot of phone calls from people that are just driving each other nuts these days. Uh, I, I think you need to settle into a routine and keep to it. Make sure you have activities that are at a regular time each day. Uh, remember uh, that you're a team. And so don't try to protect yourself from each other. Instead, try to protect the two of you from the world. Wear your mask together. I think if you practice at home, it makes it a little easier when you have to go out. Wash hands regularly. Do this together. Uh, take off dirty clothes immediately uh, as well. And, you know, FaceTime with friends and family. Stay connected. I think very, very important. So we're going to talk a little bit before, you know, we break into questions and answers about what can help lower our risk. And this is really, really important. Something that I was uh, researching just the other day, and I thought that this was uh, uh, critical for me anyway, in trying to figure out, well, how effective are all these different measures? Uh, uh, so one thing that we know is that uh, right now, it's estimated that 8% of the Kentucky population is infected. How do we know that when we've only tested 1.3%? Well, that's a projection. It's an estimate. But that, that's what we think is going on out there. So if 8% of the Kentucky population has COVID and I interact with one person out there, 
without a mask on, without social distancing, I've got an 8% chance that I might come down with COVID-19. If, if I interact with hundreds of people out there, well, that risk is going to increase. Uh, the likelihood that I'm going to run into somebody who's infected with COVID is going to increase. So first off, and this really doesn't have to do with social distancing as much as, you know, we're going to interact with fewer people. Uh, I, I'm constantly amazed, and even in my own neighborhood, and I guess just because I'm a doctor, uh, but my uh, 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 several of my neighbors have a habit every evening of uh, all coming together in a neighborhood group. And, and it's a group of about 25 people standing in very close contact without PPE because they feel safe in their own neighborhood. But that's 25 people not maintaining social distancing. Uh, I stay a ways away and just wave to them uh, I've told them before that I don't think that that's safe behavior, but uh, nonetheless. Uh, so uh, how about social distancing? How about these lines on the floor in Kroger where we're staying six feet apart from one another? How effective is that? And it turns out that that's actually quite effective. 93% effective in preventing transmission. So uh, very, very important now. You do run into trouble. I was talking with one of the staff here today who said that she was out at the store yesterday and the person behind her kept just creeping up on her and she was having a hard time keeping that social distancing. Uh, uh, remember, she had other ways of protecting herself as well. So uh, uh, if you simply ask people, so if, if somebody's coughing or has a fever, stay away from those people. Simply staying away from people with symptoms is 50% effective. Can you believe that? Because only half of the people that have COVID are symptomatic you can't protect against the others. So simply saying, have you had a fever? Are you having any breathing problems? Should not give you a false sense of security. It's 50-50, but 50% is good. Again, wearing a cloth or paper face mask like is 80% effective. And you know, what's the, what's the most certain way to not catch COVID is to only interact with people that have tested negative. And uh, the current test is about 99% accurate. There can be some false negatives. It's very rare, less than 1%. But uh, it could happen. But 99% effectiveness, those are pretty good odds. So uh, when uh, we put this in perspective, and that's really part of the exercise that I was trying to do, and we go back and say, well, what if we did all of these things? What if we know that 8% of the population is effective, but we distance socially? We stay away from people with symptoms. We wear a cloth or paper mask. And we're going to try to only interact with people that have tested negative. Now, that's pretty hard to do in the community, but it is something we created here at our center. Uh, we are currently testing all staff members and anyone that comes to the center. Uh, one day prior to their appointment, we're having them come for a swab and uh, swab is testing them for a coronavirus. And when you put together all of those measures and say, well, how safe can one be? I was quite delighted with this because we've been striving for maximal safety. It turns out that uh, the risk here right now, the estimated numerical risk of catching COVID where I am currently at the Sanders Brown Center on Aging is one in 178,571. Well, that's about the same as the risk of my being hit by lightning on the way home. One in 180,000. And it's far far rarer than my being killed in a mash on my way home. I'm not stopping by any movie theaters either. Risk of dying in a motor vehicle accident, one in 7,000 on my way home today. Risk of dying of poisoning or an overdose of, of medication, one in 71. So, 
to pull these together, right, uh, uh, in terms of your strategies and think, well, I might not be able to demand that everybody in the world is testing negative for COVID, but if I socially distance, stay away from people with symptoms and wear a cloth or paper face mask, what do I, uh, uh, what do I end up with? I end up with a one in 17 uh, 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 thousand uh, 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 chance of interacting with somebody uh, or, or dying from a, a COVID infection. So remember that these things are cumulative. So I want you to do all of them. I want you to maintain social distancing. I want you to stay away from those with symptoms. If they, they have symptoms, they need to be in quarantine if the symptoms are mild or in a healthcare facility. Wear your face mask uh, and uh, do your best to avoid those who may have had risky behaviors that put them at risk. Uh, one of the other things that I'll, I'll say uh, that I do, my wife also is very good, you know, she's armed me. In my car, I have Clorox wipes. In my car, I have gel hand sanitizer so that every time I go out, I have extra masks in my car so that every time I go out and have to stop somewhere to put gas in the car, uh, to uh, uh, pick up groceries or to come to work. The minute I get back into my own car, I sanitize. And then I drive home, I walk through the door at home and I wash my hands immediately with soap and water. Uh, and when I'm done with that, I wash my face with soap and water. These kinds of behaviors put into a routine are highly, highly effective at keeping us safe. And so I, I think that that's critical.